it's to me part of my personal interest has been in globalization, and I mean globalization not just in the economic sense, but in the many ways, cultural globalization, uh, the globalization that I think is one of the great fascinating and little appreciated pieces of the history of the world is the enormous globalization, biological globalization that has taken place uh, over the centuries as plants and animals get uh, transferred from one place to another. One of the great uh, periods in, in uh, the history of this uh, is what uh, some scholars call the uh, Columbus Exchange, which happened in the uh, years after the uh, 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 expeditions of Christopher Columbus and all that follows. And one of the things that it did was uh, inspire, I guess that's the word, uh, a huge, uh, absolutely unprecedented, uh, unprecedented uh, until that time in history, movement uh, in all directions of plants and animals of various kinds. And it had the effect of, among other things, uh, changing the ecosystems of a number of places in the world as um, forests uh, were uh, planted in uh, regions that had once been uh, uh, native plants. But one of the things that uh, interested me and uh, so many people is the uh, tremendous effects that has had on the ways people eat all over the world. And so you find, uh, you look, for example, at the things we uh, associate with Italian food, and I see pizzerias uh, here in Alexandria, so I know you're familiar with Italian food, uh, and we consider that kind of natural <coughs> Italian food, except that the uh, a tomato, of course, was a, a, an importer, uh, and so were most of the grains that are used to make uh, pizza dough. And even more, I think, uh, a dramatic example of the biological uh, globalization and its effect on food uh, was the transformation of Chinese uh, uh, agriculture and agriculture cuisine, which is one of the most complex and many dimension uh, kind of uh, cuisine to be found and also uh, remarkable in the sense that almost anywhere in the world uh, you can find a Chinese restaurant uh, making food which is made from all over the place and growing it uh, frequently in China but also growing it anywhere else. In the United States we find uh, farmers growing uh, small uh, specialty plants uh, that are necessary for, say, uh, uh, Thai food, which is very popular, I can tell you, in uh, California, where I live, uh, one of my favorites. And in order for us to have Thai food, you have to have somebody growing lemongrass and various other things. That's just one of the, the pieces of the, the kind of the globalization of many <coughs> kinds of plants and animals uh, that were native to a certain place that we know now at this point frequently can't even identify with a certainty uh, where they first, uh, quote, originated. One of the most, uh, <coughs> for a long time, of course, farmers anywhere would uh, preserve seeds, and that gradually became institutionalized into a practice where the, as seeds were transferred from one place <coughs> to another, as agriculture became, uh, in many cases, spread over large period uh, uh, spaces of the world, and it became necessary in different places for uh, societies to find ways to be sure to institutionalize the preservation of their fundamental uh, uh, seeds. And uh, what was once a very um, local kind of uh, procedure and non-institutional gradually turned into one. And part of this, one of the, part of the impact of this was the uh, uh, practice of major countries in particular uh, to uh, send their uh, natives, uh, navies out around the world and uh, give them the secondary um, mission of wherever they happen to go, get a few trees and bring back some bushes and get some uh, some seeds. So there, there again was the beginning of what became large seed banks like the, the biggest one of all, I believe, the uh, Millennium 
seed bank in uh, uh, the United Kingdom in London, which uh, is a, like many seed banks is a research center as well as a repository of seeds and has a really huge global mandate at this point of preserving all kinds of seeds, wild uh, plants and um, currently used in agriculture. And uh, there some of the big uh, seed banks in the world are places like the Millennium uh, Seed Bank in, in uh, Washington, in uh, uh, England, the uh, Vavilov uh, Institute in uh, um, Russia, Vavilov, Nikolai Vavilov was a person who was very dedicated to going about the world. I believe he made something like a hundred voyages collecting seeds from all over the world and was uh, rewarded for his great uh, services to uh, Soviet uh, agriculture by being imprisoned uh, for 20 years or so where he died. But he's, I think, one of the great figures of this particular corner of, of agriculture and of the issue that really is at the center of a lot of that, what we've been talking about here during this um, conference so far, which is the question of global food security. And seed banks are in a sense there to fo function as suppos uh, depositories of um, the world's um, agricultural wealth. And so we have uh, seed banks for the same reason we have money banks. Uh, you want to take care of your money if you have some and uh, because it's, it's very important and so you have to preserve it from, from thieves. But of course seed banks uh, like other kind of banks aren't necessarily safe. All kinds of things happen to them. Uh, I've just jotted down a few different ones that I had read about. In 1981 an earthquake destroyed Nicaragua's uh, seed banks. It doesn't mention uh, specifically which one. In 1985, starving people broke into a Peruvian seed bank and ate its uh, supply of sweet potatoes. In other words, they had uh, another uh, ideas about the usefulness of that particular commodity. In 1998, a Honduras seed bank uh, destroyed by a, uh, a hurricane in uh, 2006, the Philippine seed banks uh, were flooded uh, again during a hyphen, uh, hy <laughs> a typhoon, excuse me. That's my own <coughs> writing there. I don't know which um, seed bank in, in um, Honduras it was that was destroyed by a hurricane. There was one I visited there in 1984, uh, which was uh, entirely for the purpose of maintaining the world's uh, supplies of, um, not supplies, but, but samples of uh, banana trees. And they had them of all kinds, all shapes and sizes. And all of them uh, had originated in uh, Southeast Asia, but they happened to have found their home in, uh, out on the Atlantic uh, coast of Honduras. There are huge uh, seed banks which are national institutions which uh, uh, maintain as much of the world's samples of food uh, of seeds as they can, others that specialize on the ones of the particular crops that they use. The question now is what ways may plants that haven't been util utilized in agriculture be utilized in new ways? In other words, are there kind of latent uh, resources that uh, aren't being used because it's generally known that the amount of potentially useful uh, plants that are cultivated for food is a very small portion of the uh, plant richness of, of the world. And there are also, of course, other reasons for being careful about um, plants and seeds because so much of of the uh, medicine of certain parts of the world, Asia, 
depends on seeds, which in many cases aren't being grown in sufficient amount uh, in those countries. So that's another reason for taking care of, of, of uh, seed crops and seeds and beginning to recognize something that increasingly as a, uh, um, a global resource and not just the resource of one particular uh, area. Now, uh, we have two people here who are not seed bank uh, specialists. They hasten to uh, uh, tell me, uh, but who are deeply involved in the, the basic issues of global uh, uh, agricultural stability. And biodiversity. Uh, pardon? And biodiversity. And biodiversity. Um, both are at this point affici affiliated with uh, Cornell University. Uh, Jeff, uh, as a uh, professor at large, um, Jeffrey McNeely is also the uh, chief scientist at uh, IUCN, and he's been working internationally. Do you need to? Uh... Anyway, I met Jeff many years ago uh, when he uh, kindly came to a small conference that I organized uh, in Lisbon to talk about uh, uh, biological globalization. As I recall, that was in a time when people were talking a lot about uh, economic globalization and seemed to think that that was the only kind of globalization there was. And I uh, put together a small conference to look at some of the other kinds of globalization, particularly uh, biological. Uh, I can look at his... Uh, he spent uh, seven years in Thailand, two years in Nepal, and three years in Indonesia working on a wide range of co conservation issues. He was Secretary General of the Fourth World Congress on Protected Areas and is a member of the Order of the Golden Ark. Uh, he uh, chief was chief scientist until his retirement in 2009 of the uh, Commission on National Parks and Protected Areas later becoming program director and then deputy general director and chief scientist until his retirement in 2009. He holds a degree in anthropology from the University of California at Los Angeles. And more recently, he was the co-founder of ECHO Agriculture Partners and its founding president. Jeff? OK, thanks, thanks Walt. Um, so my, my line, and, and I, this is my story and I'm going to stick to it, is that seeds ought to be free. We all ought to be ha having free access to seeds. Uh, my argument is that seeds are a global public good and that seed banks need public support in order to make them available to everybody. So if we look at what it takes to make a, a modern high yielding variety, this is um, a, 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 a graph of what it takes to make a high yielding variety of wheat. And all these different lines that you see are, um, are genes that are held by seeds in different seed banks around the world. And you can imagine if somebody had to negotiate for each one of those lines of of genetic diversity with an owner and work out a deal, um, it would take centuries before we could get anything new. But this happened because there was free um, exchange of seeds. But I think the other critical point here is that the, the high yielding varieties that we see today have many ancestors that come from all over the world. Originally, uh, many of them from this part of the world, uh, especially Iraq. Mexican farmers plant many varieties of maize, and Mexico is, a, is the world center of maize. But when climate change happens, and not if, but when, are they going to be able to adapt to the changes? This is a map of Mexico just showing the, the climatic diversity of Mexico which is one of the reasons why Mexico has such uh, tremendously diverse um, plants and, and animals and why it's the center of, of diversity of 
wild maize as well as domestic. And the wild varieties may, that, that are already adapted to these uh, different climatic zones may be able to provide the genes that can be incorporated into the domestic varieties of maize and um, be able to adapt <coughs> to climate change. And if you look at, at Potatoes, when you think of potatoes, you probably think of something that's nice and round and, and looks like a potato. This is what potatoes really look like. If you go to Peru, which is the, the homeland of potatoes, this is what you'll see. And this diversity is something that is essential to the, the farmers in Peru to be able to adapt to the changing conditions that they face. So adapting to change is something that we need um, and if, if we're going to adapt to the changing conditions and we've certainly heard often enough in these few days at this meeting how conditions are going to change. So it's not if, it's when. Things are changing all the time. To be able to adapt to that change, we need genetic diversity and that genetic diversity is, is carried um, for agricultural plants by seeds. This is, this is a, a seed bank that saves um, what are called heirloom varieties. And these are varieties that farmers have developed for themselves. They're not uh, commercial varieties. They're ones that uh, farmers have developed and are now making available to others. Um, here's a little survival seed bank. And so if everything in the world goes wrong and you've got this little seed bank um, that's contained in these vacuum packed envelopes, you, could, you can grow your own food. And so people are um, the ones who are worried about surviving and some, something horrible happens. This is the Millennium Seed Bank that, that um, Walter mentioned. And what they are trying to do, this is uh, at Kew Gardens, uh, which uh, the, the Royal Botanic Garden at Kew in the UK is the, the host of this. They want to save samples of all wild plants. And they've, uh, in 2009, they reached 10% and they're going to continue growing. All of these seeds are free. They're, they're, uh, if somebody wants to have these seeds, they can have them. If somebody wants to, to donate seeds, um, they come for free. And this Millennium Seed Bank has partners all over the world um, this is a botanical garden in um, Australia that is hosting um, more seeds. So the Millennium Seed Bank is not just the bank in the UK. It's like, a, like the HSBC or one of the other big international banks. It's got branches all over that are, are also storing seeds. There's another very interesting um, seed bank and this one is in Svalbard, which is 1,300 kilometers from the North Pole. This is in Norway, built by the Norwegian government, cost about $9 million. And they've, Svalbard is already pretty cold. It's about, its average temperature of, the, of this mountain where they've built it is minus four. Um, but they've, they've drilled into this for $9 million and they've made a, a huge um, seed bank that for me, this one is, is really a bank in that any country in the world can send their seeds to this bank and they will store it for you. And it's yours. Nobody claims any change of ownership. If Egypt wishes to se send seeds up here to avoid uh, any catastrophic thing that might happen, a, a flood or a storm or um, anything else, then you could still go back and get the same seeds, bring them back to you. So in Honduras, if they needed the seeds that Walter was talking about, they could have had a <coughs> duplicate set up at, at this, um, this seed bank in Svalbard. Many countries have national seed banks. Um, in Egypt, it's called a national gene bank, and a seed bank is just one form of a gene bank. But there's also the others, China, um, India, and the U.S. has a very complicated one in Fort Collins. Most also have village seed banks. So these are down where farmers themselves are establishing seed banks. The, the Pavlov's uh, field station 
is a field gene bank. Uh, Walter mentioned uh, Nikolai Vavilov. He's, th he's the one, um, the third from the right, or third and a half one from the right in the dark suit with his hat on his cane. This is before he got thrown in jail. Um, and this is a, a field station where he had brought back many varieties of what have became or already were domesticated species like walnuts and apples and so forth. The Pavlovsk field station, like much in the former Soviet Union, has been privatized and they're now selling off the, the land on which all of these trees are growing to make um, houses and, and estates. Um, and this has, has caused a lot of consternation among those who are trying to, to conserve the seeds of, of trees. Because field gene banks, where the, 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 um, the, it's not just the seeds, it's actually the tree that is growing, are important, especially for trees, because some of them, many of them, the seeds are recalcitrant, which means it's difficult to store them at minus 20 degrees. Farmers, of course, have been saving and exchanging seeds um, for as long as there have been farmers. And this is just about universal. Uh, farmers are willing to change, exchange seeds because it really is reciprocity. If they make their seeds available to their neighbors, they expect their neighbors to make their seeds available to them. And this is the way that farming systems evolve. Is the, through the, the free exchange of seeds between farmers. When I was working in Nepal, um, this is one farmer, I knew her family, um, they planted 30 varieties of rice. This is Nepal, you know, a poverty-stricken country. This is, um, my, my base camp was just over that little hill there and there's a big mountain behind it and beyond that is Tibet. The nearest road is two weeks walk away. But still, this farmer had 30 varieties of rice. Why they need 30 varieties? Because each of the fields was about the size of this stage. And they were up and down the mountainside at different temperatures. So the irrigation water was a, of different temperatures and it had different exposure to the sun. So one farmer could actually manage planting 30 fields at different elevations, different exposures to the sun, different temperatures of water, different conditions. And that gave the farmer tremendous insurance that at least some of those were going to be successful. Maybe monkeys would attack one of them and eat all the rice, but then he had 29 others. And he kept each of these, as an illiterate farmer, kept each of them in a, in a pot in, in his barn didn't have anything written down, but he knew which one was which. You know, tremendous knowledge of this farmer as to have the management of this diversity. Another interesting thing that we're beginning to rediscover, um, uh, so the, the new improved varieties get planted with one variety over vast areas. What the Chinese are finding is that if you plant on the same field multiple varieties of rice, you get a better yield and it's safer. Um, you don't get attacked by the same um, pests. So what are we doing internationally? This is a, an organization called Bioversity International. It's actually used to be called the the International Plant Genetic Resource Institute, and, and I don't know if you can see this little sign there, it was called IPGRI, but now it's called Bioversity. And they're dedicated to conserving plant genetic diversity. That's, that's their mission. They're part of the consultative group uh, on international agricultural research. There's now an international treaty for conserving plant genetic resources, but you'll notice this is plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. So they focus on a relatively small number of, uh, of plant genetic resources, not, not all of them. But here we have FAO working on plant genetic resources and we've got Bioversity helping to, to build national capacities for storing, storing seeds and exchanging them. There's the Global Crop Diversity Trust, and this is what is is supporting the the Svalbard, um, the, the 
bank way up in, in the north um, through donations and, and various other ways, providing the funding that is necessary to developing countries to enable them to send their seeds up to Norway and to help prepare them for storage. So the funds are out there and they are in fact available. So what's the problem? Well, we've heard um, often enough at this meeting, we're gonna need a lot more food. We're gonna have more people um, at a time when the, t the climate is going to be changing quickly and that seed banks in fact hold only a small proportion of the, the species of the world the Millennium Seed Bank, 10%, and they've made a real big effort at it. The Global Treaty, as I mentioned, has only the, the, the main crop species. And some governments, in fact, maybe even many, are now reluctant to exchange seeds because they've become commercially valuable through biotechnology, and, and we've heard how difficult it is to get a biotech um, crop approved. It takes a lot of money. So it's become, um, there, there are now intellectual property laws um, that discourages farmers from conserving their own seeds and exchanging them. Uh, the, the whole system has become commercialized. And you remember my opening comment was I think this, is a, this should be free. This should be a, a global public good. And so controversy arises when people try to patent um, plants and so here's um, neem, a tree that grows in, in um, India that has multiple benefits to people. But a pharmaceutical firm in the U.S. tried to um, to patent the products from neem that ended up getting turned down. But many of them are in fact being patented. Uh, some of them work and and some of them don't. You know, everything from basmati rice to turmeric. Uh, all of these well known by the people who grew them, but still they're not the ones who patented them. They, it was patented by somebody else. So we, we also have heard ab about GMOs, genetically modified seeds, and these are often very popular with farmers, but they're all patented and generally saving their seeds is either forbidden or discouraged. We just heard about golden rice, which is a, a magnificent exception. That's going to be distributed free of charge. The others, um, companies, it took them a lot of money to develop these GMOs. They've got to get their money back. It's for perfectly understandable. So what, what are the farmers doing to respond? Um, they're in in uh, Peru is one example. They're making community biocultural protocols ways of, of ensuring that they have access and share the benefits to the, the genetic diversity of especially potatoes. There's a, a, a potato seed park um, up, in the, up in the Andes where they grow these and they've now agreed among themselves how to, to exchange the seeds. There's also the, an, in 2010 under the Biodiversity Convention a protocol that has now been signed by over 100 governments on access um, to genetic resources and the, the fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from their use. How they're going to put that into practice remains to be seen, but the, the concept is an interesting one. So what are the keys? I think we need to conserve all species of plants in their native ecosystems. That's where they're going to continue to evolve. That's where they are going to be able to adapt to changing conditions. We need to recognize the value of diversity. Even as the, the commercial forces in the world are trying to reduce diversity, you know, make, making things more of the same, you know, it's, a, I, it's interesting to go back to the hotel and I see KFC, Chili's, pizza parlors, <laughs> so Egypt, you can find the same restaurants in New York as you have here in, in Alexandria. Um, so greater uniformity, we're, are we losing diversity? I think we need to recognize the value of diversity. And if we're going to subsidize agriculture, we should be s subsidizing the farmers who grow diversity in the varieties that they grow. But I'd like to bring this to a kind of a, a close by 
taking off on a different track and suggesting that saving seeds, essential as it is, is not nearly enough. The, the way that we're now handling breeding is really for 19th century agriculture. It's for old agriculture, where we, we have tried to simplify agriculture in the number of species that we grow, the, the number of varieties, the land cover, the marketing systems. These are designed for what used to be agriculture. What we need is crops that are, that are, are bred for very different things. We have to adapt to the changing conditions. The, 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 the speed of changes that we're seeing in the world today are unprecedented in their speed and their magnitude. So we need to be able to adapt to that. One of the ways of adapting to it is through mixed farming. So we have plant many different um, crops on, on the same piece of land. We need to use more species, including some new things, some things that, that maybe were used as, as crops before and are no longer being used, but now we have to use them again. We have to be more efficient in the use of water. How do we do it? Well, we look at, at perennial crops, uh, genetic diversity, and then the most important thing is that agricultural um, use of the land needs to be seen in terms of larger ecosystems that surround it. Because those little patches of land that we call farms are not really isolated. Their success depends completely on the, the way the surrounding land is used as well. So if we look at the, at the kinds of services that are provided by ecosystems, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in 2005 came out with their report and they looked at, at four types of ecosystem services, supporting, provisioning, regulating, and cultural. Provisioning is, is giving us food, but without these other ecosystem services, we wouldn't have those provisioning services. And I think one of the other interesting um, elements of this way of thinking is that they added cultural services of ecosystems. So it isn't just biology, it's also your culture. Our culture, anybody's culture, depends on the kinds of, of biodiversity, the kinds of ecosystems within which they live. <coughs> and this is the way that we get um, well-being, security, the basic material for good life, health, good social relations, and the freedom of choice and action. That's the way that they defined um, the well-being. So if we lose species, it affects the resilience of ecosystems. The restoration of biodiversity enhances the productivity of ecosystems. And the areas that are of high priority for biodiversity also deliver uh, many ecosystem services. Wild relatives of crops, um, and there, there may be 250 to 300,000 species of plants, and you think about the number of crops, it's only you know, a small handful. But the wild relatives are sources of genetic diversity that we're just beginning to understand. Many of us eat wild berries. People go out and collect them. They continue to evolve by adapting to changing conditions. And I just use berries as, as one example because I had a nice picture. And um, Walter talked about Vavilov, Nikolai Vavilov, what he came up with, one of, one of his major works were, and these are now called Vavilov centers. These are centers of diversity, places in the world where particular crops <coughs> originated and have now spread all over the world through the Columbian Exchange, many others. Um, I won't go through all of these lists, but it's, it's interesting to see that different parts of the world are the homes of different crops that have become important to the entire world. So that's why we need to, to continue to exchange the genetic diversity that may be home to one region but are now essential to another region. Uh, Brazil, for example, is um, the, the home of various beans and peanuts and so forth, but they really like soybeans. They grow a lot of soy, um, and that comes from China. So that kind of exchange, and if you look at these centers of diversity, these are the places where it's especially important to maintain the wild ecosystems that, that 
originally produced the genes that led to these um, domesticated crops. So I'd like to close with, a, with six principles. The first is that diverse landscapes provide multiple services and simplified landscapes provide only a few. They might make more money for somebody, but they're not nearly as sustainable as the ones that, are, uh, that have greater diversity. And the second principle is that if we're looking at the benefits to people, it's best <coughs> assessed at the landscape scale. So if we just think about Egypt for a second, Egypt is utterly dependent on the Nile River that has its beginning in Uganda and comes from Uganda all the way down here. What happens to the, the Nile River is um, all the way down in Sudan, in Ethiopia, in um, Kenya, in uh, Tanzania and so forth is absolutely has an effect on what happens here in Egypt. And that's why we need to think about the landscape scale. And of course, governments do that. The third is to, to build ecosystem uh, services into agriculture, um, and for the reasons I've already given. The fourth is to make sure that we still have some mature ecosystems. And looking at these as living gene banks, sometimes we call these protected areas and people go visit them for the wildlife and the, the beauty of the landscape. But really what's valuable for these places is that they can serve wild genetic resources that continue to evolve and are, are still accessible to us to um, use as we need them in the future. Then we need to, to harness the best available technology to conserving the plant genetic diversity. I think we all know about this. We know that we've mapped many genomes. Genetic modification is, is widespread. Synthetic um, biology is being developed. In Texas, they've developed a, a, a rabbit that's big enough. No, they didn't really. <laughs> but uh, there you go. And we also have heard that DNA has a tremendous amount of information, but we're only just beginning to understand it. Photosynthesis is the way that plants convert sunlight into energy, into the food that we eat. If we could figure out how to make photosynthesis more efficient, even by a few percent, we would greatly enhance the productivity of food, or of agriculture. So really trying to, to understand photosynthesis better is worth a, a huge investment by the governments of the world. You know, if we spend $10 billion trying to make photosynthesis more efficient, then we're going to be able to provide the food that we're spending even more than that through other means. Big problem is that there are people um, who don't like this. She says, I won't eat anything that's genetically modified. It could be unhealthy. Well, look what she's eating. And look how fat she is. Uh, yeah, so, the, the, and I, yeah, so I, I had to uh, do some work for the World Bank to, on uh, biosafety, and I was visiting countries all around the world. When I was in Croatia, I met with scientists who were really doing tremendous cutting edge science on genetic modification. But then I also had to meet with civil society. So I met with about 30 non-governmental organizations, a room something like this. And when I was talking to them, I noticed that all of them were smoking. And I held up a package of cigarettes. And on the package of cigarettes, it basically said, you smoke, you die. And they were worried about the health impacts of GMOs, which, for which there's no evidence whatsoever while they're smoking. Yeah, so, you know, people are not rational. And this afternoon, there's, a, I'm gonna go to the session on the psychology of, of how people think about GMOs. And then the sixth principle is continue um, active public goods research, which is um, conserving the diversity, and linking diversity, biodiversity with agriculture. So looking not just at the fields, but looking at the surroundings, looking at, at the, the genetic wealth of the entire world as part of our patrimony, our matrimony. Is this mission impossible? 
<laughs> yeah, are we going to be able to do this? Uh, not going to be simple. But if we work together, it's not going to be impossible. What we need is, a, is international cooperation, cooperation between us, cooperation with the, the, the seed banks that are being established in the, in the public good that are open access, free, and looking at seeds as a, a global public good. Thanks very much. That was a wonderful presentation, Jeff, and I appreciate it a lot. A uh, number of things I'm going to want to return to in uh, discussion time. Um, Norman Uphoff uh, studied uh, political science at the same place that I did uh, several decades ago. Um, but most of his career, I believe, has been with Cornell. All of it? That's most of it. All right. Uh, he's professor of government and international agriculture at Cornell, at Cornell, currently director of the Cornell Institute for Public Affairs, having previously served for 15 years as director of the Cornell International Institute for Food, Agriculture, and Development. He's worked on agriculture, agricultural and rural development issues for over 40 years, starting as an applied social scientist, concerned with participatory uh, development strategies, local organizations, irrigation management, and social capital. He has become increasingly involved with agroecological agro strategies to meet world food needs. For the last 15 years, he has been engaged with the evaluation, understanding, and dissemination of the system of rice intensification SRI, agroecological methodology developed in Madagascar. Uh, that's the main part of it. I'm going to ask uh, Norman to take the stand. Thank you very much, Walter. Uh, when I was first uh, invited to join this discussion this morning, I said, when I think of seed banks, you always think of collections of seeds of genetic material. I said, I'm not an ex situ type, I am, I'm an in situ type type, not taking things out of their ecosystem, but rather trying to manage them within that answer was, that's okay. Uh, and I said, well, I'm very interested in this system of rice intensification, which Walter referred to. And it turns out, as I thought about it, there are a lot of interesting things we can learn from that that, that I think bear upon our subject of how do we deal with maintenance of the world seed banks, threats and challenges. What I'd like to do is emphasize the intrinsic value of indigenous varieties to be preserved, with special reference to rice. Uh, so much of our discussion really has been focusing on how we would conserve genetic potentials, genetic diversity, uh, to maintain them, which have evolved over eons, uh, for the use in expanding our capacity to make genetic improvements. Uh, and I say this is a very valid concern, but it should not eclipse the value of unimproved varieties uh, for, that they have for meeting human needs for providing ecosystem services and so forth. Uh, I think that the conservation of genetic biodiversity can be justified for its direct benefits, not just for the instrumental benefits it will have for improving biotechnological endeavors. That's not to be against biotechnological development, but we've had so much emphasis upon new varieties, improved varieties. But we find that especially if you improve the management of them, that unimproved varieties can in fact do some very uh, fine and remarkable things. All of us know or should know that genetic potentials are just that, potentials. I talked with uh, Gilbert Uman yesterday after his talk. I said, could we not use the metaphor blueprints for the gene? The gene is not a blueprint. It's a starting point. We don't replicate what's in the gene. The gene interacts with its environment to produce what we call Phenotypes, phenomena. You're a phenotype, I'm a phenotype. As my wife likes to say, we don't eat genotypes, we eat phenotypes. <laughs> That's where we want it to end up. And the plant beaters talk about the interaction of phenotypes and genotypes. The phenotype, the phenomenon, is a function of the genetic inheritance or potential, the environment, and then the interaction. 
between the genetic potential and the environment. And what we see is that if you can change the environment, you can achieve some very beneficial results over and above what you have in the uh, uh, genetic potential. Uh, the four propositions I'm going to discuss today with a little bit of visual support is that first, indigenous varieties can offer significant yields that we don't necessarily need to improve them <coughs> or very much uh, to get some very large benefits. Much of the poor performance we've seen with indigenous varieties, local varieties, has been because of the management. So in some sense, it's our fault that they don't do better than they do. That these varieties have evolved over eons in a wide variety of circumstances can help us protect against climate change. Jeff gave us some of the indication on that. Resisting the effects of drought, pests, and other kinds of hazards. And I think given <coughs> the nature of the climate change we face, we will need that quality more and more. Third, there's quality food uh, characteristics that we can benefit from in these indigenous varieties. And fourth, there's some health benefits which are still being studied. There's already kind of evidence which tells us don't simply rush ahead <coughs> to improve varieties only, but rather see what we can benefit from those that exist. But the key is very much management. This is a picture from Indonesia comparing a rice plant. These plants are the same variety, but the one on the left was grown with some modified methods which we call the system of rice intensification. On the right is the same variety, same genotype with conventional management. And so you see how different can be the expression of genetic potential when we give, in this case, rice uh, optimum uh, benefits. You're going to see this woman's rice field a little bit later in presentation and see some of her products now being sold in the United States. Uh, the system of rice intensification, I'm not going to tell you much about it other than say that we change the management of the plants, the soil, the water, and the nutrients, which has the effect of changing the microbiome, which you've been hearing about in presentations and plenary and so forth. The communities, and I say communities, multiple myriad communities that live in, on, and around the plants, and are really part of the plants. Plants are not just little sort of carbon-based machines. They are systems, complex systems, just like all of you are complex systems of your animal nature and these trillions and quadrillions and gazillions of microorganisms that help you to survive, to function, to prosper and stay healthy. The interesting thing we're finding is that once we start making these changes for rice, we're discovering the same kind of management practices are being beneficial for many other crops as well. So we're into something very interesting in terms of capturing and benefiting from the potential, which uh, the genome we presently have. This is a local variety. This is in Cambodia. A woman's holding a plant grown from a single seed. But she started with a very small seedling, widely spaced, no flooding, organic matter in the soil. The plant is monstrous. I happened to meet her about six months after I received this picture uh, from our NGO colleagues, and I thanked her very much for this picture, which I was using in PowerPoints because it's so dramatic. She went from two tons yield to six tons yield in this field here. And she looked very surprised when I told her I was using her picture for PowerPoints, and we had it on the cover of a book published in Germany. And I asked her if something was wrong. I thought maybe, you know, it's something bad for us to have a picture of a married woman, you know, being shown around the world. <laughs> and uh, I thought, mm, maybe it's a, a gender problem. She said, if I don't how you were going to use that picture, I would have gotten my biggest one. <laughs> <laughs> and she'd just taken this at random. She was sort of embarrassed. She hadn't helped us with, it, with her most impressive But the single seed in this case of rice, can have huge uh, impacts. This is a picture sent to me from Iran, where they're doing some experiments in Amul, showing the difference in the root systems. And note not just the size, but the color. See how healthy this one on the left is. The one on the right has been flooded, crowded. The roots are degenerating. By the time rice plants reach their flowering stage, usually about three-fourths of the roots have degraded, degenerated, because of the hypoxia, the crowding, lack of nutrients. What we do is we plant single seedlings, widely spaced. We cut the plant population by 80, 90 percent, and can get doubled or tripled yield from the same genome because it's the expression 
the potential is there. So I'm, I'm going to make you really enthusiastic, I hope, about the potential we already have in our genetic resources. This is finger millet from a picture from India. On the right, you have a local variety and local management. In the middle, you have an improved variety, bred by the Agricultural University with conventional management. And you see how much difference genetic improvement can make. But on the left, we have one an improved variety with alternative management, ecological management. And you see this tremendous expression of potential. We can get tripled yields with finger millet by changing the uh, management of the plant. This shows you the difference in the tillers, in the panicles, you see, how much more and larger grains you have. This is a look at the roots of these respective plants. Conventional management on the right, this more agroecological management on the left. This is a picture sent to me from Mali showing a traditional variety with 160 plus tillers on it. It was actually growing in the middle of this field. I don't know if you can see it in here. The farmer thought he was having you know, modern varieties, but there was that one <coughs> traditional seed, probably a rise of Glabarima, uh, uh, but an indigenous variety, huge productive potential that was there in the existing genome. So what I want to make my first point is that very good yields are possible if we change and improve the management. Oftentimes we've gotten inferior results with uh, indigenous varieties because we use a lot of nitrogen fertilizer. I think that's what we need to force them to grow. But these plants did not evolve in a nitrogen rich environment. They get their nitrogen largely through biological processes in the soil. And so if we add the nitrogen, inorganic nitrogen, the plants do poorly and they don't uh, give us the response we want. Um, Management can have a very large effect uh, on, the, on, on gene expression. Uh, the highest yields we've gotten with these alternative methods have come from improved varieties, hybrids, high yielding varieties. All our yields over 15 tons per hectare have been with improved varieties, but indigenous varieties can give us six, eight, 10, 12. In Sri Lanka, we had a yield of 13 tons per hectare from a <coughs> traditional variety, which is much favored because of its its qualities. In fact, I was very disappointed. I, I visited the farm of this, actually he was a deputy minister of agriculture, and he had about 16 varieties, old and new, and his highest was 16 point something with an improved variety, but he had 13 tons with an, imp with an unimproved variety. And when I came back next year, I asked him how he was doing. He said, well, I'm, I'm doing fine. I'm doing all the unimproved variety. And I saw my own bias. I thought, oh, isn't it a pity? He's not using the highest yielding variety which didn't make our methods look as good as they could, he said, but I get twice as much per kilo when I sell the local variety in the market because people can prefer the taste and the texture. He says it's more profitable for me to grow the traditional one. So then I started getting some new, thinking it's a new understanding. This is a picture from Arissa State of India where the local women are harvesting. They have a modern harvester, which is nice. Uh, some traditional varieties working with an NGO called Sambawa. And they did a study with 99 traditional varieties using these alternative methods. And three of them gave nine to 11 ton yields. Uh, 11 gave eight tons, seven, uh, seven gave fift or 15 gave seven tons, of which four were aromatic. 36 had six ton yields, 34 had five ton yields. These are varieties that normally you give you one, two, three tons, the conventional man. But if you treat them nicely, <laughs> If you bring out the potentials in them, you see some very, very high yield potentials. These are some pictures of these beautiful, Kalajira is one of the tastiest rices I've ever had. And you see how beautiful and, and diverse these are. You think rice is rice is rice, probably. Or maybe in Egypt you know rice better than Americans do. But you know, we think rice is just this white stuff. But you see the, the different morphology, different colors, different way of growing. It's really quite remarkable. So, Rice is a wonderfully biodiverse genus, and we should learn how to take advantage of it. Don't just use conventional management. Give it a good growing environment. A second statement then is that well-adapted cultivars can help give us protection for climate change. We will need to cope in the future with much greater incidence severity of pests and diseases, also more drought and storm damage. I just have one picture which makes the point that 
wonderful woman holding up the two rice plants before this. She gave me this picture last July when I visited her farms in East Java. This is her neighbor's farm on the left. Modern, improved variety with fertilizer, sprays. Hers is the traditional variety, uh, Sinantur, eight ton yield she got. This is after brown plant hopper, terrible pest, had gone through that village and devastated. Most of you call this hopper burn because the insects just you know, ruin the crop development. And a typhoon also hit, a double whammy, both biotic and abiotic stresses. She got a yield of eight tons per hectare, 800 kilograms for 1,000 square meters, eight tons per hectare. The neighbor got nothing. So it's a combination of the management, but also the indigenous genetic potentials that could be a tap to this. We have lots more evidence, but I think this picture is clear and dramatic enough to show you that we can get a lot from what's already unimproved. Mm -hmm. We can breed to try to protect against brown plant hopper. In fact, breeding problems have seldom done much against the storm damage, because that's a very hard thing to do if you're using modern methods. Quality of food is also really important. We get consumers are now more, they have better incomes, better tastes, they want better and better food. We're finding that some of these traditional varieties are much, much preferred for their taste, texture, aroma, and so forth. Uh, we're working with a small company in San Francisco, Lotus Foods, which is now importing to the U.S. organically grown SRI, indigenous varieties from Cambodia, from Madagascar, and Indonesia. Uh, this is the Indonesia called or, or volcanic rice, and Sinantur, the variety that you saw in that field of Miati, is one of the components of this mix of rices that is very, very tasty. These packets are less than just like 15 ounces, about a pound. They sell for four dollars in the market, and Lotus Foods pays for fair price, you know, you know, to farmers. So they're getting about 35 percent more income uh, in this way. And it's Farmers Cooperative that does this. And, and Lotus Foods work with farmer cooperatives in Cambodia, Madagascar, and Indonesia. We love to expand, so we can both make these this biodiversity in rice continue and make it profitable for the farmers and good for the consumers. And then fourth, I just want to say something briefly about health benefits. <coughs> this research is growing, and I'm not an expert in this, but I see bits and pieces of it. Uh, there is considerable research that these colored rices, these indigenous rices, are much higher in flavonoids, and many of them contain higher levels of beta carotene. I'm, you know, I think the work on the golden rice is fascinating, useful, I applaud that. But in fact, if we use some of the indigenous varieties, they also have these kinds of nutrient uh, benefits. And I just want to also get a pitch in that the major value nutritionally from rice is on the brand. And we've been spoiled to prefer polished white rice. Do any of you eat brown rice? Purposefully, Walter would, I'm sure. Brown rice is 10 times more nutritious keeping the vitamins and the minerals rather than throwing them away. Uh, and particularly when you combine some of these indigenous varieties and the brown rice, unpolished rice, we have huge benefits. Uh, brown rice is less milled rices, can decrease blood pressure. That's been known for a long time, well established. Lower cholesterol in the blood. Uh, they have a lower glycemic index, so diabetics you know, are better served. They'll eat brown rice because it has very slow release of the carbohydrates. So I think that we're going to start looking upon Rice is a health food. Uh, it's interesting, when IFPRI does its studies of future demand for rice, they say, oh, rice is just a staple, and so as incomes increase, its consumption is going to go down. My prediction is that, in fact, rice is going to become one of the most popular foods in the 20, 21st century. It's going to be really cheap, really high quality, very healthy. <coughs> if we take advantage of this diversity rather than all this homogenized direction we're going in, this is research I got recently from the University of Arkansas and Oklahoma State University where they fed rats colored rice to test what the effects would be. They removed the ovaries from female rice, and then they looked what happens when they have a regular diet, a rice with a diet with brown rice or a diet with red rice in it. Uh, and these were the results. And you see the first column is where they, 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 they do the operation to remove the ovary, but don't take it out. So that's a control. Second is where the ovary is removed. Third is where the ovary is removed, but they're given brown rice or red rice. Look at how the femur, you know, this is the uh, 
mineral, bone mineral density for osteoporosis. You know, a big, very clear benefit in the bone mineral content so that people can have, especially women, <laughs> have healthier, stronger bones if they'll eat the red rice or the black mm -hmm. rice uh, as part of their diet. Since it's so tasty, it's not really a handicap or hardship, uh, but it's, it's a nice benefit. And this is some more uh, look at the cortical thickness, cortical area, cortical porosity, uh, separations. Uh, not every parameter improves, but there's no harm on it, and you actually improve then the bone strength by eating these kinds of rices. Lotus Foods, which I mentioned, actually provided the red rice and the black rice for these experiments. That's how I got this. So just in conclusion, I'll say that conservation of native varieties is a very important matter, and it's not just be able to provide genes for some future improvement. That can be done, it's useful. But these indigenous varieties which have evolved over long periods of time have so many qualities which we can benefit from, but we have to look at the management. <laughs> if we manage them inappropriately, sort of unnaturally, you know, violating the conditions that they evolve for, we won't see those benefits. But that possibility is there. Our goal with this, what we call SRI is to make use of native varieties and make them profitable for our farmers and good for consumers. I will say, and I always do say, as I did say already, indeed, if you want simply yield, the hybrid varieties, the high yielding varieties will perform better. They're bred for that. But in doing that, they give up some other qualities. That's something about nature. You sort of have trade-offs. So make them very yield responsive, they're not as pest or disease resistant, so it's a trade-off. We think that we're going to have to, a very changing world. This was emphasized this morning. I agree entirely. And Jeff has also said that in his remarks. How can we <coughs> use this wonderful patrimony, matrimony of genetic resources for our benefit? In any case, we need to protect our resources. There is a place for the gene banks. But as I said, I, I'm an in situ type, if I can characterize myself. I think we have to, in the natural settings, which includes natural farming, uh, be able to, to utilize, benefit from, and conserve these resources. Well, thank you very much. I hope we'll have time to answer questions. We do have some time for questions and comments. And uh, let's come back to the uh, general theme of uh, uh, global food security, and I don't have any, although I'm kind of interested in uh, gene banks, uh, 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 we don't have to emphasize that as the answer, uh, because it, it may well not be. But mm -hmm. uh, the, the, uh, the question I would like to raise for our two wonderful, wonderfully well-informed uh, and involved uh, speakers here, and then of all of you, is here we, here we sit on a world that uh, uh, we have very strong reason to believe is in serious trouble. And, uh, I have been slowly coming to the position that uh, of one of those who thinks we're in very serious trouble. That, that's not a prediction. There are no facts about the future. But there are a lot of forces moving in the direction <coughs> of a really serious climate uh, instability, and we're already there. And there's pretty strong evidence that we are already there. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, my question to Jeff and Norman and all of you is, is so what in relation to what we know here about what's happening in agriculture uh, in order to what we have just begun to talk about a little bit about the existence of a global system of seed banks, which are not only, uh, and I may have underestimated the fact that, that most of the major gene banks are not only places where they stick a lot of uh, seeds in the drawer, but they are uh, research centers, and the two uh, uh, processes are very closely related. What can we expect from them uh, in a situation in which Hypothetically, you want me to get closer to that? Okay. What can we expect in a situation um, in which we run into um, really major serious um, 
climate disturbances, and we're already running into them, but just suppose that, that escal escalated. Uh, how do we make use of seed banks? How do we make use of the systems for international agricultural um, cooperation uh, that we have? What's possible, what's not possible? Should we feel better about the system we have at the moment, or should we just be very skeptical? Of Okay, so if, if we think about the, the future of climate change, the way that, that humans are going to, to um, perceive climate change is through its impact on ecosystems, and especially the impact on um, how we're able to grow food. And I think that the, the kinds of climates that we're going to see are not going to be unique to one spot. So a climate that we might see in the Nile Delta may be very similar to a climate that will be found in, say, the Mekong Delta. Um, and if, if that's the case, then the exchange of seeds between the farmers from the Mekong Delta, just hypothetically, and the Nile Delta is going to be beneficial to both. And so I think that it's important to maintain the diversity and to find the, the crops and the, the mixtures of crops and the ways of growing them that are going to be most appropriate for, for the climate conditions that are there, and then exchange them with farmers who are working in places with similar <coughs> climate um, conditions in other parts of the world. So the, the, what I, as far as I understand about climate change is that there will be unique kinds of climates, but they will be that also found in other parts of the world. And so having the, the capacity to exchange seeds and, and knowledge between different parts of the world is going to be essential to helping us adapt to these changing conditions. Thanks a lot, Jeff. That's good. I don't usually disagree with Jeff, but I'll give a disagreement for the sake of some good sort of liveliness. Uh, Jeff's response, I don't disagree. It would be fine to have much wider, more general sharing of seeds around the world. I made one of our participants at the conference, I think, unhappy yesterday because she was really angry at the Chinese for getting the genes for a long staple of cotton, which Egypt has had a specialty on for a long time. And I said, I understand why you say that, but I'm happy. I want free access to seeds of all kinds everywhere in the world, uh, even more radical than Jeff this perhaps. Uh, but again, the fact is, it's not, we need appropriate seeds for the environment, I accept that, but the practices are even more important. You know, in other words, I think we should find the varieties that have very good root growth and share them as widely as possible and it'll work better in similar kinds of agroecological environments. But the fact is that if attending to the soil, to again, my friend, us, uh, Amir Qasim is here who spoke yesterday about conservation agriculture. We need, I think, not about sort of certain kinds of fixes like the right seeds. We need to change our system of agriculture to be more respecting for the soil, for building its strength, its vitality, the life in the soil, to put it very simply. And so I would really emphasize that right now we have to start changing our agricultural system. We're all like those frogs in the pot of water that's getting heat hotter and hotter. We don't realize we're getting to the boiling point. But I'm even more pessimistic than Walter. I think the boiling point is there and it's not very far away. Uh, in a paper I'm doing with Jeff's colleague, Sarah Scher, for UNEP, UNEP for the Rio conference, we suggest that the first Green Revolution was made in response to the population explosion. What we face now is the ecosystem implosion. And it's going to be even more devastating than the population explosion when we start losing the integrity, which Jeff commented in his thing. So I think that we have to start saying agriculture needs to be profoundly rethought, redesigned, redirected. Uh, the kind of monoculture, energy intensive, chemical intensive production, which has had successes, has been very profitable for some farmers and even more profitable for some businesses. <laughs> That's not going to last much longer. And country after country has to start just redirecting it's agricultural practices. Farmers have to be informed, educated, brought together. Uh, Amir could tell you about the kind of conservation farming 
associations springing up in different countries where the farmers themselves are demanding from the equipment suppliers, from the chemical suppliers, appropriate kinds of technological support for a conservation agriculture which stops the kind of disturbance of the soil, the tilling, which makes erosion and loss of nutrients feasible, to bring back vegetative cover for the soil, and also then rotating crops so we get more biodiverse systems. Covering the soil is really important. I remember once talking to some Filipino farmers who wanted me to help them improve this wonderful vegetable garden they were growing with tomatoes and chilies and so forth. And I looked at the soil, it had been perfectly tilled, weeded, it's not a single weed, and these plants were sort of, you know, limp and suffering. And they said, what can we do to improve our, 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 our vegetable garden? I said, I'm not a horticulturalist, but my reaction is to ask you, the earth is our mother, right? Oh yes, the earth is our mother. And I said, why do you leave your mother naked? Bare naked, cover her up. <laughs> and I do that now with all the farmer groups I talk. The earth is our mother, keep her covered. Don't leave her bare naked. Because especially in tropical areas, the huge temperature rise from the sun beating down that bare earth destroys the life in the soil, makes it hard makes it unable to absorb the rain when it comes. Even the dew will come on a hard surface and evaporate off rather than being absorbed down into the top you know, few centimeters and so forth. So we have to start managing our soil differently, then managing our plants differently, managing the nutrients differently, and the water. The, the four things of agriculture, you manage the plants, the soil, the water, and the nutrients differently. Why? For the microorganisms in the soil. Some of you may have heard my talk yesterday showing how much what we call symbiotic endophytes, microbes, both bacteria and fungi in the plant, not just in the roots but in the leaves, even in the seeds, affect the plant's productivity and health. And so to nurture that symbiosis between the plants and the mic microbiome, we, that's a nice generalization, but we have to start thinking differently about this. And so just having seed as input or energy input or fertilizer input, this input centered agriculture is they what helped us get into this problem, mm -hmm. partly because it contributes to the climate change. Mm -hmm. And we won't get out of it with better inputs or different inputs. We have to think in agroecological systems term to manage all these plants and soil and microbes in, in, a, in a synergistic way. Then I think we might have a chance to reverse this. I'm not sure we'll succeed. I'm very pes I'm an optimist one hand, very pessimistic the other. But we've got to start right now. And it's got to be systemic, not just making one or another improvement. Doesn't Mike. that mean a, a, a major government or governments that have to be supporting that, that kind of movement? I think I'd like to see the governments on board. To some extent, I think this is going to be a, you know, a, a, a bottom-up mm -hmm. movement. You heard in yesterday about citizen science in the medical area. We need also more citizen science in the agricultural area. And again, Amir could tell you better than I about the way in which farmers in Brazil, Argentina, and other countries are starting to, to do their own research, their own evaluations, and make their own demands on the governments, on the suppliers, on the... Again, one of the problems in India is that we can have really good results with these beautiful indigenous varieties I told you about, but if the marketing system won't respect that, won't keep them separated, mm -hmm. so farmers can get the premium price they deserve, then it's really hard. I mean, the marketing system has supported this homogenization and saying we'll only buy high, you know, high yielding varieties which are very homogenous because we're just giving the mass market uh, calories. Well, we as consumers, we say we want diversity in our diet. We want the nutrients, we want the taste, the aesthetic satisfaction of these different varieties. We, from below, have to start asking for and demanding for it's kind of differentiated, diverse, stable kind of, of world. Thank you. Uh, any questions? I see one here. Uh, can you go to the uh, microphone, sir? Uh, thank you, Chairman. I just want to supplement what uh, uh, Norman had said. My name is Amir Kassam. I uh, spend most of my uh, 30 hours a day on conservation agriculture. So, but conservation agriculture really um, 
is about making agriculture smart, but not just climate smart, but smart in every, every other way, including the kinds of things which uh, Jeff talked about and Norman talked about. It's not all going to be packed into seeds. Seeds have to be grown, and not just every season, but the, the whole landscape, the field, the plots have to be at their best all the time. So for example, every drop of rain has to be captured. At the moment, most scientists don't even, like a breeder would not even talk, think about, oh, what makes infiltration stay at the highest level? He doesn't bother about it. His uniform trials are fixed agronomy. And it's that pipeline which sends out segregating material should then has to be supplemented with other things so that we're picking out the best in the best way for multiple sort of uh, purposes. So I think that what we've now learned over the last 30, 40 years is that we can make our agriculture very, very, very smart indeed. To the point where I would say that some of the so-called modern varieties are really icing on the cake. It's not the cake itself. And you saw the cakes, that woman holding uh, a plant with, with the root system. So we can have so-called uh, GMO cotton and GMO this and GMO, but if they cannot expand their roots to their full, fullest potential, just physically, mm -hmm. or if they cannot get the, the, get the older, older uh, uh, relationships going in the, in the, in the, in the field, in the, in the soil, then we will remain with this inefficient, highly expensive, highly polluting production system. Whereas all those things can be removed out of our production system now. And I can, I can you know, talk more about this. But we now have, for the last 30, 40 years, separate from the scientific community, the takeoff of conservation agriculture. And I would like to see, Mr. Chairman, that the scientific community, which has got a lot to offer to broaden its base of understanding and bring in agroecology so that we now, because the, the future demands a multifunctional agriculture. It's not just productivity. And even when Norman uh, says that, that the local varieties will give you uh, not as high as hybrid, but you know, I bet that those varieties give you that yield at a much cheaper cost and far less damage to the environment. And all the nonsense about 600 horsepower of tractor and all that doesn't require all that. And, and this massive myth about that you must go and get your fertilizer from a factory. If I want 50 kg of nitrogen, I don't need a, a Harbor Bosch process to do it for me. I've got a natural Harbor Bosch process to, to do it for me. So I think that there are a lot of smartness we can bring in. Uh, but in the end, of course, uh, we have to use both the production system resilience element as well as the genetic resilience element. Thank you. Thanks very much. Sir, right there. Good day. I am um, Eric Hutner. I run a small um, genotyping company in Australia. And I'd just like to make a comment about uh, maintenance of diversity in uh, plant breeding material. I think we, we've learned um, uh, and we've even published data on that that uh, crops which are intensely uh, bred, uh, uh, contrary to uh, popular um, uh, belief, are actually uh, remaining quite diverse because plant breeders have a vested interest in protecting uh, that diversity. Uh, we see it in wheat, uh, particularly where uh, over the last 50 years, the average diversity in the breeding line released actually increased rather than decreased. And uh, uh, conversely, we see in uh, lots of legumes uh, a very large, um, a very limited diversity because those species, especially the tropical legume, have received very little attention in breeding. And therefore, the, the available uh, material is, uh, has extremely poor diversity. Um, the other things I just wanted to say to uh, Professor Kassam is that uh, in Australia there's a lot of science in uh, conservation farming. Uh, uh, enormous amount of money is going from the farmers themselves to do proper research on the best conservation farming technology. Thank you. One more uh, over here and then we'll have to go. Uh, my name is Atul Dogra. I'm from New Delhi and working for ICARDA based at New Delhi. International Center for Agriculture Research in Dry Areas. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank both of the speakers for their good talk. Uh, I have a little query that uh, in India we are working with the farmers which are
because in India we have a rice fellow, approximately 12 million hectare of the farm, is, it's a rice fellow. So when we interviewed the farmers to that why they are keeping a field as a rice fellow, they said that we don't have the suitable varieties for the pulses to be grown. Mm. At the time we found that uh, the rate, the replacement rate of the seed is like seven, or seven to eight years, the very poor replacement rate. The farmers are saying that the varieties are not so good for us. And at the moment, we are working with them. We have introduced a system of village seed concept because the donor is ready for us to give some money. So we are providing hybrid varieties to them and the, they, we, are, we are giving some training to the farmers also uh, so that the village seed concept can be introduced and the farmer can, the, get the, can get the varieties from the farmer itself rather than going to the market and at a cheaper rate. So my question is that is we are going in a right way or what should be done to reduce the like poor replacement of the seeds so that farmer can go at a large scale okay, because, so because we are dealing with the small and the poor farmers, marginal and the small. For the large farmer they can take anything but for the mid, uh, like small and the marginal farmer there is a problem. My second question is that... Wait, wait a minute sir, uh, I think we can take one question uh, <laughs> and uh, we barely are, we, we are out of time but let's get an answer okay. to, to your question. Either, Thank you. Either. Well I think that because the varietal response at local levels is often very differentiated, we ought to be thinking about how we put in place social organization to do the, for the multiplication of improved seeds and local sale and exchange. Uh, we've seen in rice, for instance, that farmers, maybe one out of 20, will do the seed stock for the other 19, and uh, they'll get a little premium because they they settle for lower yields since they're being very, very meticulous. Uh, but we don't have any very good models. Our, 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 our 21st century seed system comes out of the 19th century models that Jeff referred to, which are mass you know, production, economies of scale, homogenization. And to get the most out of that genetic potential, you have to have it fitted to the local uh, conditions. Uh, I don't have a good model to point you to. I think in principle, as a social scientist, to go back to that role, we should be able to work out locally managed system. They need good technical advice. This is not tell the scientists go home, but rather to start thinking about how would we have this differentiated system, which is, also means the seeds are in situ where they are needed. Sometimes we get market blockages where seeds are here, but they're not there. And so in Sri Lanka, I did work with some farmers who were trying to get their own you know, seed systems uh, mobilized especially for the small and poor farmers, uh, this may be a good outlet. Thank you. Jeff, you get the last word if you want it. No? No? No, I just make one comment. Yeah. Okay. A quick one, I hope. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's great to hear that, uh, and from both speakers, uh, three speakers, saying that it's great to have free access to seeds. Seed exchange should be happening uh, across the world and all that. But that's, that's in an ideal world, and we all know that we're not living in an ideal world particularly when everything around the seed is being commercialized. So how can we you know, continue uh, to lead ourselves to believing that you know, there should be free exchange of seeds? Um, there should be free exchange of oil and gas. There should be free exchange of so many other essential commodities. And um, we will reach the time where even air has to be bought, right? Clean air has to be bought. So I think it would be, uh, uh, I think it would be sort of a dream world to think that you know, we can continue to work towards uh, the world where you know, there has to be free exchange of seeds, which I think is going to be very, very difficult. I do too. Thanks very much, uh, Jeff and Sonan. Thanks to all of you.